good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome very much, to, uh, and thank you very much for coming to the uh, to the special evening of presentations of the winners of the Performance Space Exhibition. I will not talk at all apart from introducing the moderator and jury member, but first of all, I would like to ask you if you would like to come closer to us if you've, uh, for the sake of contact. Now, uh, I would like to pass on the word to, to the person who's going to be moderating this evening, and that's Dorita Hanna from New Zealand, who is the jury member of Performance Space Exhibition and she will introduce the winners and the jury. Dorita Hanna. <laughs> well, good, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Um, if you could drag your chairs or find a chair to come forward, it would be great, because this is all about space, performance in space, and some of you are far away, and because it's a more intimate audience, it would be really nice to have a good relationship between you. As a, as a theatre architect, I'm kind of insisting. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so welcome to the, can you go back a slide please? We'll, we'll use the clickers when we're, so um, yeah, we'll give you a bit of time. So welcome to the PQ talk on, um, on performance space, which once was called theater architecture. Um, and you will find that the emphasis on the, we're going to speak to the award winners um, tonight, which is really great that they've been brought here, especially for this um, session. Um, and, it, and, and you will find that there is an emphasis on theatre design in the awards that have been selected, but we just want to start off by giving you a bit of an introduction to, um, to the project itself. But before that, I'd like to introduce you to the fellow jury members um, who um, looked at the 45 uh, uh, videos that were a maximum of five minutes each from all over the world. So, Monica Raya from Mexico. <laughs> and Monica is a, um, an architect and a performance designer. And Andrew Filmer from, uh, from Wales. <laughs> and before that, from Australia. Um, and I'm from New Zealand, and um, we were very happy to have such a wonderful range of projects from many different countries. Um, and even though uh, it was less than five minutes for the video, it took a long time, as you may imagine, to go through all 45 as well as the documentation. But it was an absolute pleasure for us. Um, and um, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and then um, Andrew's going to come and just talk about uh, some of the uh, projects that didn't make it into the awards, uh, but that kind of extend this notion of um, performance space. So um, I want to acknowledge um, Andrew Todd, who was the original curator working with PQ on the call. And um, he sent a call out, which was about collaboration, very much this notion of theater of the world and asking for videos that were um, of uh, built spaces and to, to, to discuss the collaborations that took place. So, um, and, uh, and that's fantastic. And then uh, we looked at those videos and, um, and they are being shown in the trucks in the, um, in the central hall of Vista Vishte. So um, I'm going to now ask Andrew to come up and just discuss um, some of the other projects and then our wonderful award winners who are here tonight will present their, um, their videos but also uh, give a, a, a very short presentation as well accompanying that 
on some elements of their work, which we're going to outline the questions that we ask them. So we're very honored to have them. And then they'll come onto the stage and we can have um, a discussion and, and open the questions to the audience. So, Andrew. Thank you, Dorita. Um, it was a great pleasure to look at all the, uh, the 45 entries that had um, been entered into this competitive uh, competition. Um, and because of the nature of the call, we received a very broad range, and that was what was particularly interesting for us as jurists. So I just want to take you through a few entries that we felt deserved some further comment and, uh, before we go to the four winners that were chosen. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Here it comes. I'll go here so I can put some things down. So a few that you might want to keep a lookout for in the back of the vans in the central hall. One is called Flow State, um, and this is from Brisbane in Australia by Stuckel Stone. And this was a reworking of two former cafes in a public parkland uh, which had been stripped back, so it was a kind of open infrastructure uh, in which performances were taking place, in, including those by Indigenous Australian First Nations uh, performers. So that was one that was very much embedding performance space within a parkland environment. A second one um, that we felt deserves some mention is that of TART. TART are a collaboration, they're called Theatre as Architecture, Architecture as Theatre. And in this case, where theatre architecture comes in is through the, uh, through the encounter with, between theatre and architecture. This company is a collaboration. Everything they do is built around the notion of encounter, and usually that involves the encounter between the two collaborators, Brech and GJ, as well as students and experts they bring in to work on each of their hall projects, and then the eventual participants who go through each hall, two people who are strangers who meet within the context of the hall. Um, and this, we felt, was one that was very collaborative and kind of really worked with the collaborative nature of the call that had been prepared. The Living Stage in New York City by Tanya Beer, um, Superhero Clubhouse and ex-DEA Architects and University Settlement. This was a, an act of community theatre but also community building and it was, uh, it was uh, worked through uh, the building of a living stage using plants uh, drawn from the local community and this we felt um, was a very open and very collaborative venture as well and really interesting model of what performance space can be in a community setting. Another one that was, we felt was worthy of mention as well is the uh, water theatre in Wuzhen in China and here this is a site which is not only about um, performance but also research into performance possibilities, into the possibilities of oriental theatre into the uh, construction of new kind of images around uh, the uh, material of water. Um, in the next space is the public cooling house by Punctum. Uh, this is also an Australian company. Um, there's been no bias here at all whatsoever. Um, Punctum have created this bespoke wooden space. It's kind of like a yurt, but it responds to our awareness of growing ecological crisis, and it's about performing acts of cooling in this specially made space. So audience members are brought in to, to a relational performance environment where they can choose different acts of cooling that they can have performed on them and with them by performers. And we felt that this was a very, um, a very unique and it was a purpose-built space specifically for this performance, so sewing in the notion of space and performance together. Another one which Monica in particular had, um, had been very keen on um, in our viewing of these was the dome sessions. And this is the, uh, site some site-specific interventions into uh, the Fair of Tripoli Dome by Oscar Nehemiah. Um, and this is using site-specific techniques to explore and to bring back into some kind of use and discussion um, this amazing dome space of Nehemiah. And I think the final one is the Performance Arcade. Again, this is a, a long-standing project that takes place on the harbour shoreline of Wellington by Sam Truebridge and the, the playground. And every year it's a, it's a 
collection of shipping containers which create multiple little spaces for encounter, opening out to the environment, attracting people in. So it's free, people walk along the waterfront and are attracted in to witness different artistic acts that are programmed in and around these spaces. And taken together, we felt that these uh, number of uh, different entries were testament to the range, the sheer range that we were encountering in these 45 different videos. I think that's the last one. Oops. I'll go back. So it might be time to introduce the, yeah. each of the winners to see their presentations. Great. Thank you, Andrew. So we're going to go... Um, uh, one by one through the different, uh, the four entries. But before we do that, I just thought that we'd just um, remind ourselves of some of the issues that were brought up in the brief. So our theatre of the world is, um, was, is the title uh, in relation to a global conversation about space for theatre. And we asked the, um, the groups to, because it wasn't just about the architects, it's about their relationship with the performance makers or the companies or the artists that they work with, to consider these things. How is the project ours and who makes space? What is the relationship between the local and the global? What contemporary issues can be addressed through this architecture? What traditions are you enforcing or challenging? And what elements of the environment are helping tell stories? So, do we go to this one now? We, we need to introduce our first. Can we, do we have the, um, the PowerPoints from the... <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. Yes, so the first project is a local project and um, we didn't select it because it's our host country. We selected it because it's a marvelous um, greenfield site, a, a brownfield site, um, and building on the existing docks, which is an, um, a contemporary art project. And I think you need to go back so that the um, the um, the people who are presenting can present it themselves. So, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce the people from DOCS who will introduce themselves. <laughs> uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am a director of DOCS, uh, DOCS Center for Contemporary Art. And uh, so this goes uh, automatically, is there? Well, it goes too fast, so maybe I will just speed up. But uh, anyway, the, the architect who, who is the author of the edition of space you are looking at now, and maybe we are going, uh, going to go back a bit later, but he is not in Prague t uh, tonight, so I had to take uh, place instead of him. Uh, but since I'm a director of the center, which, the, uh, which is a center for contemporary art, which is mainly, uh, uh, it's a visual art, uh, it's architecture, design. Uh, there is also a wooden structure uh, called Gulliver, it's a spaceship, which is uh, uh, for literature, uh, author's readings, presentations, and we needed a new space. We needed to uh, increase our capacity for uh, different audiences, and we were thinking about the contemporary art, uh, contemporary theater, 
Okay, so <laughs> I was instructed to let it go first, so you would see it all the way. Well, that, that's what I'm trying to. Okay, let's just watch it first and I'll just give you some notes.
Oh. Uh, I think basically what you've seen, that's what I was going to say anyway, so there is not much else I can add to it. But uh, maybe what I was saying before we, we started was the fact that there was already existing uh, institution, the DOCS, Center for Contemporary Art, which was opened uh, 10 years ago, but when we realized eight years after opening that we need additional space, we were looking for an architect who has some experience with acoustic spaces, unusual acoustic spaces, and spaces which uh, would allow combination of different, uh, different uh, programs. And this was exactly what he was talking about. And Peter Hayek, the architect who is not here, is, uh, was a good choice because we uh, both had, uh, I was a client, he was an architect, but we had the same understanding that the, the character, the atmosphere, the nature uh, of the space should be as unpretentious and as raw as possible. So, and we had the same concept with, the, uh, with our gallery space, which is it's quite a large gallery. Maybe you could uh, you would realize it that it's about 10,000 square meters, so it must be uh, the biggest uh, privately owned uh, non-profit uh, artistic space in Czech Republic. And uh, the character was always this brownfield uh, heritage, uh, raw, industrial. Uh, it was like the periphery kind of uh, uh, aesthetics. And uh, I think we, we achieved it. Maybe, uh, well, we have a small, well, it seems like I've said enough. Okay, I am not uh, going to say more, but there was a short, like two minutes uh, uh, film showing the actual use of the space for theater. Or oh, it's one and a half minute, it's very short, you know, it's just, just a teaser basically. And the next um, person we have, or people that we have, are representing the Levitating Theatre from Poland, who can introduce themselves.
Um, so before I start, I would like to introduce the three groups um, representing the three chapters of the movie that make the levitating theatre reality. Uh, first, our sponsor, Nawenshev's Drew, uh, a factory producing Chisavank and Perlash water, as well as the uh, restaurant Water and Wine. The uh, Polish Center of International Theatre Institute uh, with the Bronita Association of Bronita Manor House uh, and us, Unism Studio. So I'm half of Unism Studio, the other cosmonaut is in London. Um, so I'm here to expand more on the story of two cosmonauts from London that came to a magical place in southern Poland called Bronita. And the Branita Manor House uh, was built in the early 1800s by an architect, uh, Christian Piotr Aigner, in a classicist style for uh, Castellan, Józef Dębowski. And in 1852, it became a home of the Wojkwaniewski family, and it became the home for three generations until uh, everything was lost due to agrarian reform after the Second World War. Uh, however, after 70 years, in 2014, uh, the Wojkwaniewski family, they recovered the property back. And at the manor, the cosmonaut met a client, Agnieszka uh, keher hensel uh, who is a sonographer, and uh, she basically opened her home towards the local community. So currently, the manor uh, is a place uh, for local festivals and more traditional events. Uh, and uh, also for theatrical performances. Hence, the scenographer envisioned the outdoor theatre stage. At the close proximity to the manor, we met a chef uh, who combines innovative approach to cooking with um, uh, respect for tradition and local nature. Uh, and they also have uh, close relations with local suppliers, hence the food is always uh, within five kilometer radius. Hence the chef envisioned the dining table. Uh, when the cosmonauts came back to the manor house, they were naturally drawn towards uh, this monument of old maple trees. And the space uh, underneath the trees was already a spot for activities and a place where uh, locals uh, came to relax. Um, and the idea of the, of the trees allowed us to get rid of the columns and the roof and instead uh, use the trees to provide a shelter. And we envis envisioned the levitating theater to be simply a landscape that was lifted off the ground, uh, providing an interactive views across the site. Uh, and the foliage of the trees automatically provide us with a natural acoustics as well as the shelter from rain. So when we went on site, we envisioned the space to be one with the nature, as if it was always there, to blend with the network of the trees. And that was our initial um, abstract analysis of the site. So by having the fluid platform, it allowed, it allowed us to create pockets of spaces, and each uh, pocket provided with a different view, hence the different set and the backdrop for the performance. Um, and as the season, change, season changes, so does the uh, uh, levitating theater. So the fluid platform, uh, due to its organic shape, as well as the uh, optimized height between a low theater and a high dining table, provided us with multiple functions of a dining table, a theater stage, and a sculpture in a garden. And when we analyzed the typical flooring at the theaters, we decided that we want to use charred wood as a finish for uh, the platform in order to create the contrast between the performer and the actual stage. But also, as a uh, charring wood is a natural uh, way of impregnating wood, which makes it waterproof, weatherproof, and uh, keeps the insects away. But also, it creates a very uh, soft finish, which can be felt when someone is walking barefoot. Uh, and we've hidden the lighting behind the aluminium frame in order to uh, emphasize the charred wood even further. Um, so during the day, it looks like a sculpture, but at night it becomes a beacon of light, uh, which illuminates the park in the darkness, but also brings people together. Um, and for us, the, the cosmonaut became an activist, designer, builder, uh, maker, filmmaker, 
it was essentially alter ego, which we created at the very beginning in order to bring attention uh, to the act of construction, which took two months so the local community could come closer and treat it as an actual event and talk to us. Um, and when we did the initial site analysis, uh, it became clear that in order to get the fluid platform, we had to fabricate bespoke uh, structural frame, and that was an issue. However, we managed to fabricate uh, the frame ourselves as well. Um, so the, the longest beam uh, exceeded over six meters when we uh, fabricated the whole structure. So when cosmonauts came on site, they uh, did everything from foundations to columns and structure. And the frame became a guidance for both the, the structure as well as the uh, aluminum detail profile and the plexiglass. Um, and in early September uh, last year, we uh, finished the project and we officially handed the keys to our client. Uh, and right now we're in the process of designing the initial um, event which we envisioned, the one which would combine food and performance into a single experience, where basically the meal becomes an act and the ingredient and acting uh, tells the story about the food and where it comes from. So the event which we envision would take a whole day and um, it would include a series of smaller performances leading to a final event at, at night. Um, so, so far, have we got sound? Uh, so, so far, um, the stage um, has been used for various of workshops and, um, and smaller uh, picnics. However, recently uh, it came to our attention on YouTube that a local folk band uh, came over uh, one day and they uh, performed on the stage. And this is what I would like to show you as a final performance piece. Have we got sound? Okay, great. thank you so much. Wonderf wonderful presentation for, for a, a lovely, small, charming theatre that engages with the landscape. And um, I look forward to, if we have time, being able to, <laughs> being able to discuss it further. So um, our next um, award winner is from the UK, Jason Flanagan, and the project is Soundform. And we'll show the video.
Hello, I'm Jason Flanagan. Um, I'm from Flanagan Lawrence, but I'm also from Soundforms. Um, so Soundforms is both the name of the structure, this mobile acoustic performance shell that we've created, but Soundforms is also the name of the organization, a company that we've created. Um, so in effect, what has happened here is Mark Stevenson, the conductor who you saw on the, the film with me, he started out as our client, but actually, because we've developed this project, we've financed it, um, in a strange kind of way, the team has all become the client as well. So boundaries definitely got blurred. But it was a, an amazing collaboration. Um, from the outset, we were working with Arab on the acoustics, um, the structural engineering, which is quite complex with Expedition. And we also mentioned in the video ES Global. So we, we realized that if we were gonna design a structure that would be successful in being transported, it needed to be lightweight, and we needed to understand actually how to ship that. And ES Global are one of the best in the country, in the UK, for creating rock stages and shipping them. So it was a truly collaborative project, but it, it started quite small. Um, when Mark Stevenson first approached us, he had a, a little traveling chamber orchestra called London Musici. And all he wanted to start with were just a few acoustic panels that would help him and his band sound better in some rather dreadful atria in office spaces in London with appalling acoustics. But as the conversation developed, he started to talk about the fact that as a performer, because he's a cellist um, and a conductor, every time he'd ever played outside, the acoustics of the structures he played in were appalling. So why couldn't we design a good structure acoustically for orchestras to play in outdoors. So we started to kind of look back in history at some of the structures that went into arenas or bandstands and kind of realized that the, the, the fundamental challenge of performing outside is that quite often you're performing in, in one of the structures on the left, which is perfectly good for rock and roll. Uh, the structure keeps the weather off, it can support the lights. Um, but the fabric has got absolutely no acoustic performance whatsoever. And Mark and his orchestras are used to playing in the image on the right, which is a classic concert hall interior. This is the platform end, where you have a whole series of acoustic reflectors above you and around you that creates the onstage acoustic that the orchestra needs to play better in ensemble. And it occurred to us that nobody had tried to put these two things together in a mobile structure before. So that became the kind of the, the, the question, the research question that we posed to ourselves. And at this point, this was a project without a brief, without a budget, it, it, even in, in reality without a client. It was simply something we were starting to think about. The second challenge for us was that we knew that we weren't gonna be developing one structure. At the very least, we'd be developing three different structures to cope with the different sizes of, of performance bands from a string quartet all the way up to a full orchestra. Full orchestra. So together with Arab Acoustics, we started to look at what the geometric ratios we needed to produce the internal volume to create the onstage acoustic. And that in the first instance is so we can create the kind of space where the performers can hear each other and play better in ensemble and therefore create a much better performance for the audience, but also creating a structure where we can project that sound out to the audience. And you can see here the small, medium, large, they relate to the quartet stage, the chamber orchestra, and the full orchestra stage. And what we realized when we'd done this was we'd asked and answered a question that nobody seemed to have answered before. And that gave us the ability to patent this recipe for these shells. And that then gave us the ability to go out and raise funding and see, these are some of the diagrams that Arup produced, which is the proof of concept. So at the top, you've got sound escaping from a performance straight through the fabric, which has got absolutely no acoustic performance whatsoever. And at the bottom, if it starts again, here we go, you've got sound waves, which are then captured within the internal volume of the acoustic panels. They create the onstage acoustic, and then it's projected out to the audience. The architectural wrap, the envelope, is largely to do with keeping the weather off, but also to do with kind of creating the whole impression of what we want the building to look like. So we developed uh, a prototype of the smaller structure. The arrows on the left are all the acoustic reflections, both on stage and out to the audience. And this is the, the, the internal structure 
And the whole thing really does revolve around this image top right, which are these two pin connections, which allows the whole structure to be lifted up like a pram lid with the fabric. We then inflate it, we lift the acoustic panels in place, and we're ready for the concert. And it's been tested with solo pianists, the London Philharmonic string section, amplified events. But what's been really gratifying is the fact that it sounds absolutely fantastic, both on stage, it's got a real warmth, and we can project out naturally without any amplification to an audience of between 1,000 and about 200 people. And we're currently going through a design process of scaling this up, we've gone right the way back to the beginning of the process. And this is a permanent structure that's gonna be located in San Diego, in the harbor there, for the San Diego Symphony Orchestra. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. So we've come from um, uh, part of a, a very urban brownfield site complex with docks here. Um, we've gone on for this wonderful um, activist uh, dinner um, landscape performance site. Um, and then this beautiful sculptural form that, that, that can travel. Um, and we're going to finish with our last presentation, our last award winners who are from Hong Kong, um, Theatre in the Wild. Um, and um, I'll get you to introduce yourselves. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Claire and Miss William. We are from Out and Fire Productions from Hong Kong. So maybe we can begin.
Thank you. So uh, to begin with the presentation, I would like to introduce to you where the site is um, exactly is. So it's in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is in the south of China. And the city is consists of mainly um, the Hong Kong Island that you see at the, at the south, and the Kowloon Peninsula, and the new territories which makes up the largest part of the city. And the site is located in the northeast of new territories, which is um, right next to the border between China and Hong Kong. And our site is in Peng Che, um, that is um, where you see. Here is right next to the Shenzhen River, and it's um, just adjacent to Shenzhen. And here's some pictures that are taken um, at Peng Che, where you can see the huge contrast between um, the Hong Kong and Shenzhen, because um, in Hong Kong side, you can see it's mainly it's, um, made of farmland, or a warehouse uh, of um, car or recycling or construction industry, uh, and also a few dispersed local villages. But on the Shenzhen side, it's all skyscrapers on the, uh, across the border. So um, the pink chair is under the new development plan of the Northeast New Territories under, uh, initiated by the Hong Kong government. And um, in this, um, under this development plan, uh, these non-indigenous villages people, they are the most vulnerable group uh, in fighting for the rights to stay and to fight for compensation. And these people, they are facing eviction from the homeland and the home will soon be demolished to, um, to open the way for um, new future development in the northeast of um, new territories. So um, Amtiscape is an art group, a multidisciplinary art group um, that we are focused on exploring abandoned space in the city. And I'm also one of, uh, one of the group, uh, one of the member of the group. And we hold the first uh, art festival in 2013 in an abandoned village school in Pengche. So um, this is the interior of the school hall, and this is the um, main performance venue for the first art festival. And we have invited artists, performers uh, to come to the village uh, to, um, uh, to explore this abandoned space with different um, kinds of art intervention and different medias. So this is the concert that was held in the village school. And the song that you listen in the video is actually a song that's collaborate, uh, collab collaboration between uh, villages and the musicians uh, to make that song. And the site of the theater in the wild is uh, the Janki Farm, which um, uh, we have been working with uh, since 2013. And in 2013, um, the farm is still managed by an old couple and is still very active. But in 2016, the farmland has been abandoned because of the health problem of the owner. And actually, abandoned farmland it, Abandoned farmland is not uncommon in Hong Kong because of the declining agricultural industry. So what comes to our mind is what we can do with this abandoned land. And so um, our 25 productions, which is um, we have been closely working with, um, we have designed a performance space in this abandoned farmland. And I'll pass the time to William to further explain about the design. Hi, this is William from, thank you. Claire. This is William from R25. Um, actually, uh, this is the first plan of our uh, outdoor theater. It's called Theater in the Wild. It is made of a ribbon of uh, a long uh, translucent fabric, which is uh, situated in a rural farmland, which composed with uh, a bamboo poles and then surrounded a group of um, performers and the, uh, and the audience. Um, the shape of the um, transparent fabric actually uh, defined the front stage of our main performance stage. At first, we came to the abandoned farmland, which was uh, full of weed. And uh, after a few years of uh, abandonment, and then we think about how about we uh, enclose uh, the actual farmland and to create a space inside for the performers. Um, after a few trials, uh, we laid down uh, the 24 feet wide um, pallet build stage in the front and then set up the seating. Uh, uh, in the middle of the creation, 
uh, we found that uh, actually uh, at the uh, moment for the sunset period, uh, we can uh, actually f cast the uh, shadow of the bamboo um, trees onto the backdrop of the theater so that uh, we rearrange the main performance um, at time for sunset to ensure that the dynamic uh, shadow of the um, bamboo trees can be part of the performance. So um, the dynamic uh, pattern of the moving um, fabric and the timely changed um, shadows actually become um, the part of the performance and this group of um, villagers and the performers uh, started their first main performance on our stage. Um, this uh, temporary theater is actually uh, made of a very simple material which is locally found and recycled material. Uh, we set up this theater with a few volunteers and uh, with a very quick assemble time using uh, the vertical structure, which is the bamboo poles, which uh, the farmer usually use for the, the farmland. And then um, a three rope uh, connecting to the top of the vertical structure, uh, stretch out the uh, fabric. And we develop the bamboo uh, nail, which is embedded into the soil so that the fabric can stand. Uh, we try and test out a few forms of the fabric so that uh, the dynamic form can be created. Um, this is the final uh, glance of the uh, completed theater. And this kind of uh, theater um, adapt any kind of uh, a performance that um, which is uh, engaging the nature and people sitting there actually immerse into the nature itself. Uh, you can see people is sitting along the direction of the farmland is uh, the, the former farmland. So um, the flexible form and the um, uh, the ease of construction actually uh, make it uh, further to develop another type of outdoor theater, which is uh, the second version is it at the upper front, and then uh, it is a smaller pop up. Uh, theater with frames um, with frame structure at the back, and we also play carefully play with the light and shadow effect of this structure. And then we try the third version, which is inside the middle of the city uh, for uh, outdoor screening event. So, uh, as being uh, an architect, is not only um, responsible for producing a design solution, but also to respond to the uh, society. So I, I give back the time to Claire for yeah, the current situation in Hong Kong. Just uh, one day before this, um, um, actually, this presentation. Yes, um, um, at the end of the presentation, we would like to talk about what's currently happening just in Hong Kong yesterday. Um, Indeed, all the ideas, actions, and our works that we have just talked about is, have been built upon the freedom which we have had for decades, and freedom of speech, freedom of demonstration, and freedom to engage in artistic creation and cultural activities without the fear of prosecution by the authority. And now these rights and freedom are at stake with the tightening control by the Chinese government. And yesterday, just one day before, there was an immense protest in Hong Kong, and over a million people went to the street to stand against the government plan to allow extradition to mainland China. We are fear that under the extradition law, dissidents, activists, and civilians in Hong Kong, including foreign visitors, could, could be sent to face trials in mainland courts which are controlled by the Communist Party. But Despite the large number of Protestants, um, the government show ignorance to the opinions of the vast majority and insists a second legislative reading in this Wednesday. So here we would like to call for your attention and support to the opposition of the extradition law. And we'd like to call for your support to us, to Hong Kong people, and to civil rights and liberties. Thank you. Take a seat.
Okay, that's a very profound and urgent ending, very contemporary too, um, to four what I think are great presentations on four very interesting and wide-ranging performance spaces. So I'm going to ask um, the people to come up here who were presenting and their colleagues, if they are bringing their colleagues. And um, Monica Raya is going to ask a few questions. We don't have a lot of time, um, but we'll probably have a couple of questions and then we'll throw, throw it open to the audience. Um, the way I'll do it is uh, I'll ask uh, each one of the groups uh, one question, but of course the idea is that uh, the audience can also make an intersection with the questions and uh, continue asking the questions from these original ones and, and then uh, the privilege of the presence of the architects and the creators of the projects, we can, you know, see them in action, you know, like the, the, the thinking in action. So, um, the first question would be for Docs, and uh, I would like to, to ask you about your audience. How is your, the audience reacting, coming to this housing, and, you know, like these new installations that are, you know, an extension of an activity that was previously there. <clears throat> well, uh, since we were already quite established as a center for contemporary art, so we had our uh, Prague's and Czech Republic's and also Central Europe's uh, visitors uh, already developed audiences, so we were on the map, so to speak, so uh, when we extended our programs and also physically extended the space itself, it was uh, part of our uh, philosophy where we thought that we should combine different disciplines because traditionally there was a very uh, relatively uh, hard uh, distinction between the performing arts, uh, visual arts, uh, architecture, design. So it was always all different disciplines had their audiences and we thought that our center should mix it and often we have a project, so the exhibition which is um, really uh, visual arts with a theme which is then uh, transported or used in a theater performance or literature references or so it's a uh, more theme-based than uh, artist, uh, single artist or single uh, kind of performances. So for us it was uh, uh, quite simple because our existing audience uh, naturally continued to, uh, to, to see whatever we were doing and at the same time we were able to attract attention from uh, uh, specific uh, theater uh, goers uh, to our space. So it's like uh, multiplication of uh, audiences, which we thought it's quite uh, logical, quite natural. And today it's quite common that uh, different uh, uh, centers uh, say that they have, they have a theater or they have, a, they have a exhibition places, but usually it's like a, you have those two spaces next to each other or three spaces next to each other, which they continue with their specific programs, but we are trying to mix it really uh, together. And often we develop these projects uh, simultaneously. So that's, that's the difference. With this um, combination and uh, like no border in between, you know, the, what we used to know as different uh, performance disciplines like theater and dance, now that, you know, that we can just go through those disciplines. Um, I want to ask our cosmonaut uh, about uh, being uh, this activist and, you know, getting involved into the chef thing, into having food and all these um, different uh, roles that as an architect you are now playing, how comfortable you feel 
you know, like really flying through all these different roles? Um, I think at the beginning, the biggest challenge for us was to go outside the computer screen, because to some extent, um, architecture is seen as a person just sitting in front of a computer, but in fact, it can be so much more. And our experience with generally making, uh, especially in universities, or making little sculptures, that was like something initially that pushed us and gave us confidence to go outside that comfort zone and actually build everything ourselves. Um, so, as, so initially it was first the architect, then the designer, then the activist, then the builder, and essentially it was expanding and expanding and expanding until we even reached a filmmaker level um, and yeah, I would definitely, we would definitely like to try something of that scale again, because it was definitely so much fun, and it really felt like holidays as well. And, uh, you know, going to this expansion of the role as an architect, what I found very interesting about what Jason was saying was, suddenly the team became the client. So it was the own creators that became the client. And so in that sense, uh, is it that then the, the issues that you want to do, you know, about music and things that since they come from you and your own team, you know, were you, did you have a, a much more demanding, uh, you know, uh, responsibility into what you were designing? Were you freer in the sense that the client was not imposing anything, it was just the team as a client, can you talk about that? It certainly wasn't freeing, no. Um, I, th I think <clears throat> as architects, we're always designing to a budget, but actually when you're designing and it's your money and you've only got so much and that's what you can spend on the structure, it makes you, it forces you to make some quite specific decisions. So we'd gone through a whole process in the design and we, we, we were fairly confident about where we were heading with the design, but we had a certain amount of money and what we effectively had to do in the end was scale the structure to the amount of money we had. So, I mean, it sounds quite commercial, but at the same time, the project itself is scalar. So it was a proof of concept that it worked as a prototype at that scale. Um, and now what's interesting is that kind of restriction of, of, of finance is gone, we're liberated, and you know the, the, the other clients that we're now working with, two of the clients have got much, much, much larger structures. Um, so the San Diego is one of them. There's another structure where the enclosure wraps not only the performers, but also 3,000 audience as a, as a lightweight fabric structure. But at the same time, we've gone right the way back to the beginning and we're designing a tiny little version of it in timber for four people. So they have, they have similar issues and ultimately they all come back to the same core principle, which is they've got to sound good. It's all about the music. And then uh, I am very uh, moved uh, it, by the sensuality of the theater in the wild. Uh, sometimes we forget about the luxury of the sensual. You know, architects, we tend to always go for the shelter and the ceiling and the protection from the outside. And then suddenly to encounter a project that uh, shelter, uh, that give us shelter in a different way, that plays with this precarious uh, ribbon of fabric, uh, see-through fabric, um, what, I'm, what I would like to ask you is that since uh, you've mentioned it's a pop-up theater and it's very easy to assemble, it takes uh, very little time to assemble it. Can you uh, talk about that experience? Because building, it's usually a long process. You know, it takes time to build. So we have the project and then suddenly, you know, years later, maybe, you know, we'll see it. Uh, finished and you know the construction of the shell took time you know the the theater took time since it was uh, the cosmonauts doing it and of course the big the big work of you know expanding a building in the middle of the city takes time so can you please uh, 
share what it, how, how long does it take to, to do the pop-up of this uh, theater you've designed? Because I think that's what's uh, really great about having an architecture that can be built in, 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 you know, in an hour. Or can you explain how, how long it takes to, to do the pop-up? It takes two days. Yeah, nearly two days. But um, before the festival, actually, we had spent one or two weeks to test to test out the form. I think the the difference between an architecture and what we've done here with this temporal theater is that is more, more like an experiment. And actually, we don't have the form and the design of the theater in our mind when we started to build, because we we just collect what what kind what materials that we have in hand, which is bamboo and this fabric. We just got them in hand, and then we test out in the field. And then throughout the testing, we find out that um, a circular form could kind of create an embracing atmosphere. And then it's also because we have um, worked on it until sunset, and that's why we discover the shadows. So it's something that is more accidental and, and more experimental. So I think this is what um, makes us feel interesting about this kind of temporal theater. And yeah, to answer the question, it's just two days with a team of eight people uh, to construct the, the, the fabric the portion and then with the pallets on the ground. So it's a very short process. So now I will extend the questions uh, to the audience. And you know, hopefully, you will do the intersection with uh, our incredible uh, designers and architects here. Uh. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for wow. Where do I hide? This beautiful work. Um, unfortunately, my question is uh, for the jurists, uh, and I suppose whoever's here from the panel. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Prague Quadrennial has permission from Andrew Todd. Uh, to uh, show this exhibition that he conceived. Is, does anyone know about that? Permission question? Yes, sure, we know. Um, I, d I don't think it's necessary to go into it, except that my understanding is, having followed it on, on lots of avenues, um, is that Andrew co-conceived this with the PQ, and so um, it's a it's a joint um, it's it's a collaborative as is the whole spirit of the project. It's a collaborative um, uh, section, and um, he is he is credited as being the curator. Where where is his design. credit? So your short answer is no. His credit appears nowhere in print or at the exhibition. And I believe all of you would have received the call from him and replied to a call from him. So this question is an interesting one, just because my, my concern is we're a creative community and we depend upon, for example, credit for work is, is a huge a aspect of what we do and how we exist. Oh, you, no, you acknowledged him, you acknowledged him, but credit is a different thing. So on the behalf of PQ, I would answer this question. Andrew was uh, author of the open call and together with the artistic director, Margareta Fantova, they curated the exhibition. However, uh, the, at the end, uh, we discussed the spatial solution and uh, we parted on the fact that we couldn't afford or go ahead with his project and we chosen another project that were two different things. And he himself decided to not to continue as a curator. So we decided to part in peace Piece. And he is uh, on the website. He is listed as a co-curator, so and uh, Dorita mentioned him. Th there is there was a also a stage when he wished not to be mentioned. He and sent a cease and desist, and there's a legal lawsuit going on. So I don't believe there's uh, a kind of um, well. Uh, uh, the whole case was discussed it, uh, discussed with uh, our lawyer. There is no any lawsuit at the moment, and everything so, was. So uh, I, I think I think it's important just to say publicly amongst everyone here that. Uh, a member of the architecture community and theater community who has a uh, long history with Prague Quadrennial, represented France in 2011 in the architecture section and conceived this call uh, and organized the beginning of what we've experienced as a beautiful uh, presentation of really important and beautiful work. And I really want to apologize for the question interrupting other 
great questions that I'm sure will follow regarding the work, but I think it's, it's an unfortunate occurrence that needs a public airing. And uh, as far as I know, uh, he is not feeling credited and there is some kind of uh, legal situation going on. So I, I wanted simply to bring it out and, uh, and say that that's the case. Uh, he should be here, essentially. Well, um, I think that uh, we are aware that there's that thing is going on. And I think that he could have definitely been here if he would have wanted to be here. So in a way, you know, it would have been great to have him here. And yes, there are legal things going on that uh, actually our, uh, the winners have nothing to do with that. Of you course, know, the goal is, is what you saw, 45 projects that have nothing to do with uh, who called them, but the work is there. And, and now we just wanted to share what the, the winners of this uh, call, we, we are not discussing, you know, the legal, the legality of the call, but we would like to, if, if you're okay, to continue with uh, asking the winners, because the, the, the thing I think today is not the legal thing with no, of course not. PQ, My, but uh, the thing with uh, the, the project. <laughs> has been turned off, but I, I'd like to just say no, that it's the, not turned off. the architecture section of this event is getting smaller and smaller every four years, and this kind of, if I do dare call it uh, confusion, veering towards problem, perhaps scandal, I don't know, uh, I'm not him, uh, but I was very excited to see him here, and uh, I imagine the people who responded to the call as well. So um, my understanding was the issue about how it was shown didn't have the budget, but that somehow, in a very unceremonious way, he was excluded in a very uh, severe way. So I had to bring it up, and, and I also, because as a former resident of Hong Kong, uh, I want to say uh, we should perhaps lead the chant. No extradition. Yes. As yesterday in the streets, I say no, you say extradition. No. Extradition. Thank you. No. Extradition. No. Extradition. No. no. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Okay. Does anybody else want to um, add something to the pro uh, to the uh, act, uh, out authors of the projects? Uh, if I may, I do. I do have a question. I'm pa Pavel Drabek. I'm the curator of PQ Talks, together with Barbara Přihodová. I would first of all like to congratulate the winners for four diverse and fantastic projects and for the wonderful presentations that, that you've given. And I would like to ask about three topics that uh, come back to the core of PQ, transformation, imagination, and memory. And I'm not an architect myself, I'm a theater historian, uh, but I would be interested in understanding the process of imagination where it started with a particular situation, whether it's brown fields, or in the case of docks, or whether it's an idea for a, for a special catering, if you want, combined with performance, or a, a concept for an acoustic solution to looking at revivifying or offer, offering pop-up spaces, and I wonder, if you could speak about the, the process of transformation of what there is and the imagination that is behind it. It's a very broad question, but I don't want to preempt any answers. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks for the questions. And, um, Maybe we, we, we can come with the uh, very first idea of uh, how we imagine the space uh, on the very open, wide uh, uh, farmland with, uh, in the far behind with the uh, mountain ridge behind. And across the border, we can look into our, 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 our borderline um, in between China and Hong Kong. So, um, first of all, we, we have this imagine the space that um, we are building an architecture, uh, actually a temporary theater, without blocking the background. So, this is the first step that we have uh, in our mind. 
Um, so we explore what kind of materials that we can get from the northeast of Hong Kong, which is a uh, um, mainly bamboo and temporary materials. Uh, and we, we talk to the farmer and to the villagers and understand the, the um, um, daily life or, or what kind of uh, uh, technique that they have uh, in their uh, farming process. So with the materials on hand, uh, we want to express the uh, entire environment and like Claire said before, um, we test it and experiment uh, it uh, throughout the two weeks, and then uh, we found the optimum solution to to the performance. It is uh, taking some risks. Uh, as you see, uh, we, we are using the, the sunlight and the shadow as the background of our theaters. What about if that is a rainy day? Okay, it, it is kind of, uh, we, we are taking some kind of risk, but um, we have some plan uh, throughout the whole period of the, the festival, the art festival. We uh, created uh, two uh, separate uh, main performance and concerts there, and we are selecting some of the important days uh, for the main performance. So um, besides taking the risk, uh, we, we may be uh, uh, pushing forward or backwards to the performance time to ensure that uh, the sunlight is here. But luckily, uh, at the performance days, uh, uh, the outcome was perfect uh, with our uh, 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 presented uh, environment. So um, that is kind of uh, the thinking process. And is that the imagination behind yeah, the, the whole creations, yeah. Um, I guess for us, the, the aspect of imagination, or uh, I would, the, the most important element was actually how everything happened, how it was envisioned. And it just happened casually from the conversation between Conrad, the other cosmonaut, and our client. Um, from a casual tech, w uh, talk, what if? There will be something uh, at the end. The, uh, the the project actually happened in reality, and back at the time, uh, both of us we're not even a master students of architecture. We are freshly from BA, so technically no one would even uh, treat us serious or um, or even give us such opportunity and trust us with budget and to actually deliver something of the scale. So that aspect of casual conversation and imagination and trust was actually what led to the final project. And thanks to our client that she trusted us, the project happened and it was built. Um, I, I think the imaginative process on sound forms was quite iterative. So a, a lot of the initial thinking was very physics based. It was about sound. But you need an imagination to understand sound because it's not—it's not something we can visualize. So we were constantly struggling to actually visualize what it meant to create a space that would sound good. And then once we found a, a, a geometry that could express that, we had the beginnings of of an idea. And and that imagination became a belief because a lot of the time with acoustics, until you've built it, you don't know whether it works. We knew it was going to work, but even on the day of the first test concert, we arrived at the site and the entire um, stage had been rigged with microphones, loudspeakers, because the people who were running the event didn't believe it was going to work. They just had no faith whatsoever. Their imagination and our ability to actually make it sound good was, was zero. So we stripped it all out, <laughs> took it all away, and it worked perfectly. Um, I think the second aspect that took quite a big imaginative leap, leap was we didn't want the structure to look like another temporary stage. So the majority of tensile fabric structures hang. So we thought, well, what's the opposite of that? Convex. So that led us to thinking about, well, why can't we inflate the structure? 
So we then went through a technical process of understanding what that meant to actually get a structure that would be convex rather than concave. And then we realized it actually is gonna give us a lot of strength benefit because it's gonna help us tension the structure and strip out a lot of the tonnage of the aluminium that we didn't need. So these kind of questions that we pose ourselves become iterative, imaginative leaps. Well, <laughs> you had the advantage of having a serious problems, serious engineering problem, acoustic problems, uh, materials problems, so that's, uh, uh, that's a nice problem for, for experts. Uh, in our case, uh, we were locked into uh, perimeters of our, uh, of our land, so that was uh, the size of our buildings. We had a limit uh, for the height, we had the limit for the, uh, for the roof angle, so all these things were uh, so um, straightforward and simple that we had to try to create uh, as good acoustic or environment as possible within the given uh, constraints, and uh, we were lucky to achieve that. We, we thought it's going to be quite good because we could today, everybody is using the modeling the, the space uh, acoustics, but uh, ultimately, until you actually try it, there's always this uh, small percentage of uh, question marks and mystery and, and fear, and uh, unless you, you shoot or have the first uh, test, you, you would never know. So we were pleasantly surprised, but I think it's part of the magic of the process. You combine things which you have no, uh, no ability to control, and then you combine it with traditional skills. And, uh, and I think very good uh, philosophy is also not to try to be, and that's our philosophy, we are trying not to be too articulate. We are trying not to design things like, and this is not a criticism, your space looks fantastic, but it's, a, it's like, a, like a new age production. It looks fantastic and works very well, but we are more, like going back to medieval times, structure-wise, you know, monolithic, you know, heavy uh, structures, but with uh, fantastic uh, sound uh, uh, qualities. But uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's a more, it's a combination of luck and combination of loose hands, you know, we, and faith as well. So that's our creative part. I think, uh, you know, just, uh to also uh, put the questions back into the audience, or maybe the reflection that we all need to have. Uh, look at again, look again at the questions that have been projecting on the screen. I think that they are actually pretty interesting, especially uh, how is the project ours and who makes space? You know, we live in critical times, and I, what I like is that we are all different, we come from different countries, and the, you know, these particular uh, issues, the critical issues we live in, you know, if we were to have a political conversation, I'm from Mexico and, you know, like really, really, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, unbearable things are going on in my country. So, what I think we do as architects is address the issues or at least also raise the questions. So uh, I would like you to consider that at some point, you know, who makes the questions or how is the space created and who owns the space? It's, uh, it's definitely on the list of uh, ideas we need to keep on discussing. It's not going to be easy. There's always going to be tension and we should be happy about that because that's how creativity comes along. And you know, if nobody, if anybody else wants to share something, we're about uh, ready to finish this encounter. But uh, thank you, thank you very much for attending it. Uh, we are definitely working in the architecture section for the PQ, the PQ to, to make it stronger, vibrant, you know, and uh, make bigger calls. So it's true that we live in the conflict and the tension of what we need to address. I'm going to ask um, Andrew to sum up, but I just personally want to thank 
the people who came here. I want once again to acknowledge Andrew and to thank the person, I don't know who you are, but we can talk afterwards for bringing it out in the open because this is what theatre is all about. Um, uh, and I think it was an amazing diversity and um, I think these questions can still be uh, contemplated. But um, Andrew, if you could sum up. Well, thank you. I think that that's along the lines of what I was going to say towards the end here is um, because of the open nature of the call that was posed to um, all the different uh, potential contributors, we received a range of um, responses that in each way brought into some kind of focus a relationship between distinct performance traditions but also particular local circumstances as well. And I think we've seen that play out here both in terms of the way each uh, of these projects was uniquely sited, even if that site becomes a mobile zone. They're responding to particular historical conditions um, in terms of uh, existing brownfield sites, um, but also each is modeling a world, um, modeling a way of bringing people together in an act where people gather to do and to watch and where watching is itself a doing. Um, and also what's particularly interesting with, the, with uh, all of these is the way in which that watching that doing relates to a broader environment in some way, whether it's um, particular companies that, uh, that Docs Plus collaborates with and are finding a home there, responding to that real beautiful concrete box, or to the surrounding environment, the ecological concerns, the community concerns and the politics of, of, of land and land use, but also the way in which music might be shared to a public in a public space. So I think it'd be great if you could all join me in thanking our uh, wonderful winners for their presentations and for their contributions tonight. So, thank you. Uh, excuse me, just one more uh, announcement. For anyone who wants to experience first-hand uh, architecture, docks, since we are in Prague, since you are in Prague now, and it's a real space, a real city, a real time, a real emotion, it's a real experience, so everybody's invited on um, Friday and Sunday. Uh, it's a performers, and uh, there is a walk through the space, and it's a huge space, and it's a... Uh, it's an interesting experience, and there are little brochures on your tables, so I just took the opportunity to do a little promo since you are all interested in it. Thank you very much. <laughs>